All right, so in terms of this shift that we're going to start making today from just writing a looping structure to actually using that looping structure to do something useful, I'm going to model how to write a very simple algorithm um, where we're going to prompt the user to enter a sequence of integers, and then I'm just going to display the sum. We're going to return the sum. But this can serve as an example. This can serve as a template that you can use later today, tomorrow, when your group is trying to create your own more sophisticated algorithms, at least this gives you a structure to start from. Okay. So we're going to create another public static method. And it's going to return an integer. And we're just going to call it sum. It's going to sum up all the digits that the, all the integers that the user enters. For now, we're going to, so every one of these common algorithms we're going to be working on over the next couple of days, we're going to use a scanner object and we're going to ask the user to enter something, either an integer or a word. So we definitely will be creating lots of scanner objects. So I'm going to create a local variable of type scanner. I'm going to name it S and I'm going to say new scanner system.in. Oops, system.in. We're going to initialize a local variable called sum just to keep tr the running sum of all the numbers that they enter. And a local variable called value which reflects the value that we do. All right, here's an example. So one of the things we've been discussing is when do we use a while loop, when do we use a for loop, when do we use a do while loop. In this case, we want to prompt the user at least once to enter an integer. So a do while loop actually is a better fit here. It fits, it fits nicely into this particular situation. So we're going to ask the user. We're going to print, system out print. We're going to sum just positive integers. So we're going to say enter a positive integer. And then here's the issue we run into with a terminal based application like this is how do we know when they're done? Right? So we need some way for the user to specify I don't have any more integers for you to sum. I'm done. Um, and often what we use for our terminal based programs is some other value that will have a special meaning. So we're going to use negative one for that. So we're going to say type negative one to quit. So here's a new, new terminology for today. We'll put this in a comment block so we capture this. this. This value that has a special meaning that causes our loop to stop running, we call it a sentinel value. And you may be familiar with this term from, from previous classes. What that means is basically it's, it's a value for in this, in this example, negative one. It's used to terminate a loop. Otherwise, this loop would run forever and we just keep adding up numbers. Um, it is often entered, entered by a user. Not always. It could be part of a file format, but often it's entered by a user. So. All right, so we've asked them to enter a positive integer. Now we need to actually read that integer and assign it to our local variable value. So we'll use the next int method to read in the integer value. So maybe they type in 7. And then we want to increment our running sum, increment that variable sum by whatever value they typed in. And this loop is going to continue to run while the value they entered is not equal to negative 1. And we'll return it. So type this, compile this, run it, try it out, see what you get.
I'm going to try it too. I'll run the sum method. I'll type in 1, 2, 3, 4. I'll make a prediction. The sum should be 10. Negative 1 to quit. It returns a value of 9. Doesn't work. Why not? What do you think? Yeah. When they enter the negative 1 to cause our loop to stop, we're still adding a negative 1 to our running sum. That's why we're off by 1. Here's another off by 1 error like we were talking about on, on Fridays. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to comment this. This is such a common bug in algorithms that I don't want to fix it right here. I'm just going to make a note saying this is a bug with a big exclamation point. Sum is one less, one less than it should be. Because I want us to keep this version of the method that is <coughs> wrong, and then we're going to fix it. But we can go back and look at it, look at it later. Let's copy this entire method and paste it below and rename it sum2. So here's version 2 of our sum method. We want to fix the bug. We're going to get rid of the bug. I'm going to remove some of the other comments just to make it a little bit more concise. There are multiple ways to do this. Um, perhaps the best approach would just to add, be at, to add an if statement and say like, hey, if uh, the value is negative 1, then or if the value is greater than 0, increment sum by value. And that would be fine. Um, we have another option, too. So I want to show you an, a different option, which you haven't seen before. And then we can discuss why we might do one versus another. Um, so here's the different option. Once we read in the value, instead of checking if it, the value is not negative 1, let's check if the value is negative 1. So if value is equal to negative 1, we're going to use a statement that we've seen once before in a different context. We're going to use the break keyword. And we're going to write a little note explaining what it means in this context. So break, there's our keyword, new keyword for today, or not that, we saw it once before. What break does is it immediately exits the innermost loop and this should be familiar because this is similar behavior as in switch statements. So thinking back to the switch statement from the previous chapter, in each case block we used break to get out of the switch statement. Here we're using break to get out of the do while statement. So when this break line of code is executed, nothing else in the body of the loop runs. The flow of execution immediately jumps to after the loop, in which case, in this case, we're going to return sum. Here's the trade-off. Okay. When you use a keyword like break, this is an unexpected change in our normal flow of execution. The loop doesn't behave like it normally does. Um, and so those who read your code, including your future self when you go back and read your code, may be surprised by this. Okay? So this isn't a black and white issue in terms of which way to solve it. It really is a judgment call. Um, and we want to make our code as expected, as readable, as maintainable as possible. And so I think there is a place to use a break if you're dealing with kind of an exceptional situation. Um, and if we had a more complicated algorithm and we didn't want to wrap the whole algorithm inside of an if, this might be an, an appropriate solution. Okay? So it is certainly a judgment call. You never have to use break. You could always use an if-else statement. Sometimes the judicious use of break leads to code that is more understandable for everyone. Let's run it again. Let's see if now it works. So I'm going to run sum2. 
and I'm going to type in 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1. Hey, hey, sure enough, it runs, returns 10. Let me try it one more time. 1, 2, 3. Oh, no, I tried to hit a 4, and I hit an R. I hate it when that happens. OK, so let's look at this. Um, if I accidentally type in a letter instead of a number, the program isn't happy. It just crashed. We got an input mismatch exception on the highlighted line of code where we said, hey, read the next integer. But instead, I typed in accidentally a letter. R is not an integer. Our program crashes. It would be nice. We haven't worried about this up till now. But now we're to the point where we, we have the tools where we could be a little bit more tolerant of mistakes that the user makes. We can do some in basic input validation. So let's try that out. Let's make our program even better. So let's copy all of sum2, and we're going to create the third version of this method, sum3. So the issue is that we've told the user to type in a positive integer or negative one to quit, but what if they accidentally hit a letter? Okay. Um, there is a way we can check for this um, in a more tolerant way than just having our whole program crash. It'd be nice to give them a second chance. Okay. So there is a method that we haven't explored that can help us with this. And this is a method that you all will be using shortly um, when you work on your common loop algorithms as a group. So the new method we're going to explore today is the hasNextInt method. So the hasNextInt method um, of the scanner class returns true if the next token to be read is an integer. Otherwise, it returns false. This is super helpful. We can basically ask the scanner, hey, is the next token an integer? Okay. And to be clear, we're not reading the value. We're just like peeking at the value while leaving it there for co other code to read later. Because we don't want to read it and check if it's an integer because down just right down here, we're going to actually read the integer. Okay? We want to basically just peek at it and leave it there to be read in the future. So to be clear, let's add this too. This is important. It does not consume the next token. It's still there to be read. Um, and also, though, it behaves like next in. If there are no tokens in the stream, it waits until there are, just like next int does. So this is a great thing to put inside of an if statement. We can say if s dot has next int equals equals false. Okay, meaning it's not an integer. Then we can be more flexible. We can actually tell the user, "Hey, you typed in the letter R. That's not a positive integer. Try that again." All right. Um, it is important here, once we've detected that it's not an integer, we do need to still actually read it from the stream. And a nice way to do that is to actually include what the user typed in in our message back to the user. So let's print a message to the user telling them they didn't follow instructions. Um, I'm going to put it in quotes, what they typed in. So I'm going to actually escape my quote character. And then I'll read in, I'll do next. I'm going to read it as a string. So no matter what they typed in, we can always read it as a string. So I'll say s.next, and I'll put my closing quote, is not an integer. Try again. And here's how it relates to our looping structure that we're learning about. We, we want our flow of execution to basically jump up to here so that we can prompt the user again to enter a positive integer. We don't want any of this code to actually run. In fact, if this line of code does run, our program's going to crash. So again, we have options. We could put all of this code in an else block. 
Okay? Or we can use a new keyword that we haven't seen before. So let's take a look at that. We could use the continue keyword. And we'll describe what it does. Continued does two things. The first is just like break. It immediately skips to the end of the innermost loop. That behavior is just like break. So continue is going to immediately jump down to the end of the loop right here. But here's where it's different than break. Whereas break means break out of this loop, continue means reevaluate the condition. And if it's true, continue the loop, which is what we want. We want to ask the user again. So the second part of continue is that it reevaluates the loop condition at that point, meaning the end of the loop, and continues if the condition is true. So I think continue is a really good name. Um, continue this loop. That's what we want it to do. So try this out. Compile and run this. Make a mistake, type in a letter instead of a number. Oh wait, does our code doesn't compile. Ooh, value may not have been initialized. Ah, uh, true. So we need to initialize it to something. And the reason why this didn't show up before is now with the continue statement here, there's no guarantee that this line of code is going to run. So we might be trying to evaluate this condition before we've ever initialized value. So we can pick pretty much any value for value as long as it's not negative 1. So let's just initialize it to 0. This is pretty similar to that rewriting loop thing that you just had to do. All right, now compile and run it. And I'll do the same. Yeah. One, two, three, R by mistake. Hey, good, R is not an integer, try again. Excellent, we'll try four. And it returns 10. All right, so again, do we have to use continue? No. In fact, on the AP exam, you will never be required to use break or continue. I think you should be aware of those because you'll see it in other people's code. Um, and also, I think when used judiciously, it can actually lead to cleaner code. Break and continue are best used for like exceptional conditions. The user shouldn't type in the letter R, right? So using a continue to deal with that exceptional condition, that's OK. It actually keeps the code, the main part of our algorithm, keeps this cleaner because we don't have a bunch of if-else stuff just to deal with when they type in a letter instead of a number. Okay. So keep, keep that in, in mind. 